there are many dark tales from the Middle Ages, so today we've compiled seven of them for this video. Some are creepy, others funny, but all of them are strange. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The course of true love never did run smooth. In 1340, Ines came to Portugal as lady-in-waiting to Constance of Castile, the wife of Prince Peter, heir to the Portuguese throne. Despite being recently married, Peter fell in love with Ines and the two began a secret affair that went on for years, resulting in them having four children together. Peter's father, King Alfonso IV, didn't like the influence that Ines had over his son and tried, unsuccessfully, to split the couple up. Constance died in childbirth in 1345, and Alfonso immediately tried to arrange a new marriage for his son. But Peter refused to wed any other woman than Ines, who sadly was not considered suitable to be the future queen. To make things worse, Peter's illegitimate children were thriving, whereas his son with Constance was in poor health. Ines's brothers were also thought to have too much influence over the prince. The king banished Ines from court, but it just made Peter love her even more and the couple lived together in Coimbra, where it is alleged that they secretly married. With his attempts to keep the lovers apart obviously failing, King Alfonso decided that Ines' presence was politically risky for the continuation of the royal family, and ordered her assassination. Men were sent to Coimbra and beheaded Ines in front of her infant son. Swearing vengeance on the killers, Peter was able to have two of them captured. They had their hearts ripped out because Peter said they didn't deserve to keep theirs when they had pulverized his. When his father died and Peter ascended the throne in 1357, his love for Ines was just as strong. Legend says he had her body exhumed, dressed in royal robes, and decorated with jewels. He then had the Portuguese nobles kiss the hem of her clothes and pay her the homage that she didn't receive when alive. Peter and Ines were buried with their coffins facing one another at the monastery of Alcubasha, because Peter promised that they would be together until the end of the world and they can look at each other as they rise from their graves at the Last Judgement. Or a zombie apocalypse, whichever happens first. You can't take it with you when you die. Sometime before 1066, when King William I rebuilt London Bridge, John Overs worked as a ferryman. He took people across the Thames River from London to Southwark. John paid an annual sum to the city authorities, which allowed him to have a monopoly on the ferry route. He soon grew quite rich and was able to employ several servants and apprentices. He successfully invested this first accumulation of wealth by becoming a moneylender, and soon amassed a small fortune, making him as rich as any nobleman in England. Although this caused him to be excommunicated from the church for usury. Despite his wealth, John was a terrible miser who deprived himself and his loved ones from any of life's little pleasures, working all hours and not feeding himself properly even in his old age. He had an only child, a daughter who was said to be both pious and beautiful, and despite his penny-pinching habits, he loved her and was willing to spend money on her education. John would go to market himself instead of sending his servants and buy cheap stale bread, mouldy bones for soup or meat so rotten that even a dog would refuse it, anything just to save a few pennies. One night he decided not to feed his servants and thought of a great way of getting them to skip a meal. He pretended to be dead and forced his daughter to wrap him in a burial shroud, believing that his servants would be so upset at his demise that they would fast for the day. Then John would pretend to recover. However, when they heard of his passing, these servants were overjoyed. They took money and bought bread and cheese and ale and threw a party around John's corpse. He was so enraged and wanting to punish his employees, he struggled to free himself of the shroud. On seeing this, one of them thought it was either a ghost rising from the dead or the devil, and proceeded to beat John to death with the butt end of a broken oar. Because of his excommunication, John was refused a Christian burial. His daughter bribed a monastery to bury her father, but when the abbot found out, he had the body dug up and thrown on the back of a donkey. The animal wandered through London unguided, until it arrived at the execution place at St. Thomas at Watering, where it bucked the corpse from its back. So John Overs was buried there, and then beneath the gallows. Ironically, John's daughter entered a nunnery and gave all of John's wealth away to charity anyway. Binge drinking can actually kill you. 
In November 1120, William Adelin, son of King Henry I of England and heir to the throne, was sailing back from Normandy to England. There were 140 knights and nobles and 18 noblewomen from the royal court on board the White Ship, as well as oarsmen, sailors and servants, making 300 passengers altogether. Departure was delayed until evening as Prince William provided everyone with copious amounts of wine. By the time the ship disembarked, quote, the vessel was overcrowded with riotous and headstrong youths, who had all been binge drinking. As the ship set off in the dark, she struck a rock on her port side and quickly capsized. William might have survived had he not gone back for his half-sister, Matilda. His boat was swamped and William along with the others who were trying to save themselves were drowned. Of the 300 passengers, only one survived, a French butcher who was found clinging to the rock. The repercussions for King Henry were immense. The loss of his only male heir caused a period of great upheaval for the English throne and a civil war between England and Normandy lasting 15 years that became known as the Anarchy. The moon is made of green cheese. One summer in the mid 12th century, probably in the reign of King Stefan of England, two children arrived in the village of Woolpit in the county of Suffolk. The children were found by some villagers near the Woolpits that gave the village its name. The children, a boy and a girl, were unusual in that they had a green tinge to their skin, strange clothing, and they spoke in an unknown language. The English abbot and chronicler, Ralph de Cogsall, reported that they were taken to the home of Sir Richard de Calm. There they refused to eat any food for several days until they saw some green beans which they happily ate. Eventually they adapted their diet and ate other foods and their green complexion began to fade. The children slowly learned how to speak English and were able to explain that they came from a place called the Land of St. Martins and it was held in great esteem in the country of their birth. They had no idea how they arrived in Suffolk, but they were out in the fields one day tending to their father's sheep when they heard a great sound similar to church bells ringing. Suddenly, they were transported to the fields of Woolpit. They said that the sun never rose in their own land, and they lived in an unending twilight and a wide river separated them from another luminous country. Soon after this, Sir Richard took the children to be baptised. Sadly, the boy later died from an unknown illness. The little girl, however, who became known as Agnes, grew up and worked for Sir Richard for many years until she married. There are many theories about the green children of Woolpit. Were they aliens? Were they fairies? Travellers from another parallel universe? Was it Shrek? Or were they simply malnourished children who had become separated from their parents and got lost? It is strange though that they could not speak or understand a word of English. Perhaps as the English writer Robert Burton declared in 1621, the children had fallen from the moon. Hell hath no fury like a fed up woman. Emperor Flaviacino ruled the Byzantine Empire in the late 5th century. His reign was plagued by religious dissent and domestic revolution, but it is his death that people find to be the most interesting. Zeno died in Constantinople on the 9th of April, 491. The cause of his death remains a mystery. Some say it was dysentery, others epilepsy. According to the Greek historian John Zonorus, Zeno fell unconscious after too much drinking, which is more plausible when we consider what happened next. The Emperor Zeno was married to Ariadne around the year 466, but the marriage was arranged by Ariadne's father, Leo, who wanted an alliance between his daughter and the Isaurian officer, Zeno. Apparently, Ariadne wasn't all that keen, but did as her father wanted, as so many women have been forced to do over thousands of years. After his untimely death, Zeno's body was put into a sarcophagus and interred at a tomb in the Church of the Holy Apostles. However, he awoke from his stupor to find himself buried alive. He began to shout loudly to be taken out of the tomb. Despite his pleas, Ariadne would not allow anyone near Zeno, instead choosing to let her husband die a slow and painful death from dehydration and lack of air. Over a period of three days, Zeno's cries of, have pity on me, got quieter and quieter until they eventually ceased. A not so soft landing. 
Henry was a French count and the King of Jerusalem in the 12th century. Like the troubadour de Cousy, he joined the Third Crusade and was a leader of the French at the Siege of Acre, where he was wounded. In 1192, Henry was sent to Tyre by his uncle King Richard I of England to inform Conrad of Montferrat that he had been elected the new King of Jerusalem. A few days later, Conrad was murdered by two assassins. Controversially, Henry was immediately betrothed to Conrad's widow, the pregnant Queen of Jerusalem. Henry's uncle Richard didn't hesitate to give his permission for the marriage, which happened just eight days after Conrad's death. It all seemed very convenient. Henry died at Acre in 1197. Supposedly, he was leaning out of his palace window when the balcony gave way and he fell out. A servant, who was a dwarf named Scarlet, tried to catch hold of Henry's sleeve. Weighing too little, Scarlet was unable to hold on and pull the king back, and he also fell. It's said that Henry died not from the fall, but from his servant landing on top of him. Scarlet also unfortunately died from his injury. I ate it with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. So the 13th century story goes, Chatelain de Cousy was a troubadour who had an illicit affair with the married Lady of Fael. He went to the Holy Land to fight in the Third Crusade, and unfortunately he was mortally wounded at the Siege of Acre. As he lay dying, he begged a fellow soldier to remove his heart and take it back to its true owner, the love of his life, Lady Fail. The man did as he was asked, but foolishly when he arrived at the home of de Cousy's lady love, he told her husband about the request. Lord de Fail took the heart, cooked it, and then served it up to his wife for dinner. It was only after she had eaten the meat that he told her it was her lover's heart. Horrified, the lady refused to eat anything ever again, and naturally, starved to death. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Do hope you've enjoyed it, and please subscribe if you're enjoying the content as we do release a new video every Friday. Cheers!